I'm Nick Pettit. I'm Jason Seifer. And you're watching The Treehouse Show, your weekly dose of internets where we talk about all things web design, web development, and more. In this episode, we'll be talking about font families, the hamburger menu, Flux, and more. Let's check it out. First up is this really cool site called Font Family Reunion. Now, whenever you- Get it? I, family reunion. But font family, which is a CSS property. Yeah, like if it were Wheel of Fortune, that would be like the before and after. It's like a play on words. I wish there was a name for that. Yeah, I don't know. This is font family reunion. It says compatibility tables for default local fonts. So basically what this tells you is if you're using the font family property, and you just give it, well, in this case, nothing, this is what's going to happen. It's going to use the operating system default font. And in, that, in this case, on all these different variations of Mac OS X, Windows, iOS, Android, and so on, it's using the Times or Times New Roman font. And actually, excuse me, on Android, it's going to use Droid Sans. On Windows Phone, it will use Segwa. Se 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 let's just segue. Let's segue right out of that one. And that, that's our OS defaults. But if we actually type in something like, say, Helvetica, which clearly I've already done here, and click Show, these are the fonts that will be used. Now, in most cases, since Helvetica is a pretty standard system font across the board, it's supported most places, it will actually render Helvetica just like you'd expect. So on OS X, it will render Helvetica. Here on Windows, it's actually going to switch over to Arial because Helvetica is not installed, but it at least uses a sans serif font instead of using Times New Roman. Again, on iOS, it's going to use Helvetica. Android's just like, I don't know, I just, I love Droid Sans so much, I'm just gonna use that. And then once again, we get Segua, se, se, Segway se go. on se go. Windows Phone. And yeah, anywho, really cool site. You can type in any font here and figure out whether or not that's going to be well supported on different operating systems. Yeah, very nice. Uh, next up, we have a very, very thorough post called All This, which goes on to tell what the value of this will be in different contexts in your JavaScript applications. Now, it starts with the most simple version, the global this. In a browser, this is the window object. And right here, they have a script that says, hey, log to the console, whether or not this is equal to the window, and that returns true. If you are going to test for more equality here, we have this variable foo, which is going to be defined in the global context. This.foo will equal foo, and so will window.foo. Now, if you create a new variable without using the var or let keyword in ECMAScript 6, you're adding or changing a property on the global this. So here we are using another variable called foo. It's set equal to the word bar. We redefine that in a function. And as we expect, when we run this and then run the function, it changes bar to foo. Now, if you are in Node using the REPL, this is the top namespace, and you can refer to it as global, and it does exactly what you would expect. But JavaScript is a language with many possible different scopes. Inside of functions, this can be different. It can refer to the function or the global, and it can have different meanings depending on whether or not you're using the strict version of JavaScript and you can also get type errors by trying to set that inside of a global function. Now, you might think that's it, but no, there are even more possible definitions and scopes of this. And there are so many, in fact, that I'm going to allow you to read this for yourself because it is so nuanced. Uh, there is actually a ton to know, 
and you can get yourself into trouble if you don't know exactly what this is because you may be setting different variables and different scopes. So definitely check this post out. It will be in the show notes, which you can see right below this video. I got to check this post out. Yep. Let's see what you did there. Next up is a wonderful article called Testing the Hamburger Icon for More Revenue. Now, we've talked about the hamburger icon many, many times in the past. This is the three bar icon that you see on lots of websites that usually represents an icon for a menu. In fact, it's so enlarged here, I wasn't even really sure what I was supposed to be looking at. And maybe that is, in fact, part of the problem with the hamburger menu. It's not necessarily clear that it's a menu. Now, I really like this blog post because a lot of mobile or really any kind of test results will focus on things like engagement or page hits or whatever. This was a really literally dollars and cents test. It, it figured out, does a different type of menu icon make you more money? And it turns out the answer is yes. There, there's been a couple different tests that were done here. And this ended up being the winner. So they had a three-line menu here, and then they also had the word menu right underneath there. And uh, like I said, all four treatments brought in more revenue than the control, just the normal three-line hamburger menu. And they say not just clicks, engagement, or other soft metrics, dollars. And that was really pretty cool. So the lesson here is, is that the hamburger menu might not be so money after all. I bet they were pretty full after all that hamburger menu testing. Full of money. Next up, we have an article explaining the Flux application architecture. Now, the Flux application architecture is something that Facebook has recently put out, and there's even libraries and examples to work with Flux. Now, this whole article walks through understanding Flux, which can be pretty complicated. Now, here we have a to-do component and a to-do store. This is going to be a very, very basic stripped-down version of a Flux application. So what's going to happen is this to-do store is going to store the different to-do items, and then the to-do app component will render them. So what happens when you create a new to-do item? Well, the user will enter that, and then something called the to-do action creators will create it, fire this action that says, hey, this has been created, and then something called the dispatcher will figure out what to do with that action. Finally, the dispatcher will call the callback of to-do store, send that to the to-do store, which waits for and emits a change event sends that back to the to-do app component, which will potentially re-render it. And then this whole thing can happen very many times. Now, this article walks through and shows you what happens at each of these different points in the application with code. You can, of course, download the entire application example. But what's great about this is it shows you where exactly everything is happening. And it gives you the snippets from the different parts of the example, along with commentary on what happens. Now, I'm not going to go through and read everything here, but if you've been struggling to understand the Flux architecture, definitely check this out. Now, something else that's important to remember about Flux is it is different from the model view controller architecture in JavaScript. It's a completely different paradigm of thinking that involves one-way data flow. Also, completely different architecture than what was featured in Back to the Future. Right, that would be the flux capacitor. That's what, which interfaces with the time circuits. That's what I thought this article was going to be about. Very I wonder, wonder what's going to happen when this website hits 88 miles per hour. Very uh, disappointing. It wasn't about time travel. Uh, next up is a UX project checklist. Uh, this is a wonderful checklist that is well about UX. And it's broken down into research, planning, exploration, communication. And it's a lot of stuff that you want to make sure that you're doing kind of as you move through these different phases 
of your project. And the nice thing is that they have links for every one of these that go to different resources that sort of describe what each one of these aspects is. Now, research, planning, exploration, communication, that's all kind of boring stuff. There we go, creation. Let's just get right into it, not do any kind of research. Uh, UI elements, we got those. We got some, uh, some gestures, it's responsive. All right. Good. I think the, um, the website's all done. I don't want to hear any feedback about it. No. Just kind of. You don't need to. Finalize stuff and yeah, I think, I think that's it. Testing, pff, we're not going to do that. No. But anyway. Waste of time. Really cool stuff. Definitely be sure to uh, use this maybe on your next project and kind of look through each step and really think about whether or not you want to do these, and then as you go through, we can check them off. Yeah, don't launch your website without each one of these being checked. Exactly. you got to do every single one of them. Maybe. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. That's all we have time for this week. I'm at NickRP on Twitter. And I am at Jay Cipher. For more information on anything we talked about, check out the show notes right below this video. Thank you, everybody, for watching, and we will see you next week. Thank you.